My mother's father's family were Afrikaans and, and quite kind of important in the Afrikaans community in that they, my great grandmother laid the cornerstone of the Fur Tracker monument. And my great grandfather was a well-known Afrikaans writer, a guy called Gustav Preller. Um, but, but I didn't really, my parents both spoke English to each other. Most of their friends are English. There were a lot of Afrikaans people in my life, but I did go to an Afrikaans nursery school. And, and a lot of people tend to focus on the bad and they tend to be yeah. absorbed in, in what went wrong and how their parents didn't do the best job possible. But parenting is not a zero sum game. I mean, mm. there's, there's no way around it. If, if you end up with good raw materials genetically, that helps, but it's not uh, indicative of, of overall success. And if you end up in a, in a life where there are very few resources and there's conflict and there's a lot of, you know, deprivation and that kind of thing, it's obviously, it's not insurmountable, but it doesn't help. It, it, kids are very fragile things and they take on a lot of good and a lot of bad. Well, first of all, in South Africa, there, there are a lot of people who, who actually pray to the ancestors. I mean, we've got a, a huge indigenous population whose spiritual beliefs and 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 background is tied to the ancestors now to me unless you know something about those ancestors you're just pretending so that's massively important in in the okay. south african context because if you're going mm -hmm. to say that you that you care about african spirituality the very least you can do is actually find out something about your particular ancestors you can't just mm -hmm. but this is what's interesting about being alive now and i think we are the luckiest people that have ever lived Mm. And obviously, mm. there are probably generations in the future who will who will look back on us and go, "God, those poor things! They were suffering so horribly. <laughs> they had no idea of what the world really was about, and they, they seem so primitive." Just like we look at, at past generations and, mm. and we judge them quite harshly. But we are living in a great time. There's there's less famine. There's less pollution. There's less. I mean, we, there's more forestation happening at the at the moment than has happened in in two or three hundred years, thanks to democracy and liberty and and freedom and, uh, and, and the ability to express yourself and, and the access to the internet. We've got a generation of people who've grown up thinking all of that has always been there. And they have no appreciation for these very, very massive strides. And, you know, I think it was Newton who said, I stand on the shoulders of giants when he wrote his treatise on, on mathematics. Hmm. This is what we have no appreciation for how, Everyone has toiled and suffered before us. That much. And if you don't learn about your past, you're bound to have some, some mistakes committed in the future, which you could avoid. But to go to World War II, here, both of my grandfathers had to, had to fight the Nazis, right? They actually had no option. They had to put on a uniform. They had to get into airplanes because both, both of them were in the Air Force. And they had to fly over other people shooting them to try and kill them. And they had to try and survive those three to five years that they were in active service. Yeah, I, I used to listen to John Burks and, and, and Stan Katz and Gary Edwards and guys like that on 702 in the day. And I had the, the pleasure of eventually meeting my heroes. I didn't know that I wanted to go into radio. Um, I certainly liked radio. Radio was for me a fun place because it's imagination, right? I mean, it tells the story to a million people and each of them sees a different picture. That's very powerful something that TV doesn't have, something movies don't have. Books have it. People don't read books anymore. I think that's important. You have to learn, especially as a, as a child and, and later in your teenage years, you have to learn to fit into the crowd that you're in. And mm -hmm. this even applied later on in life when I would be, you know, I was in my, in my 30s and doing gigs for 20-somethings in a, in a nightclub. Um, and it forced me to... to have conversations with people much younger than me. And then I would be attending lectures with people at the, you know, Rand club when they were talking about paleoanthropology. And I'd be, I'd be talking to people in their sixties and seventies and treating them with equal respect. And, and it's hard, it's hard to be deep and meaningful and, and intelligent because you should be listening a lot more than you talk. Mm. Mostly you'll find that the people who have a lot to say are also the least informed. And if you're interested in a lot, you have a certain predisposition to pay attention. I am, I'm, I'm curious about everything. I, I, I want to know as much as possible. I think the, the most happy death I could have is a death where my brain is full. 
um, where I've where I've learned a little bit about everything, or even a lot if I'm like if I'm lucky. And and heaven for me would be a time machine where I could go yeah. back and forward and see the the moment of Genesis and see the moment of of of, of the assassination of Julius Caesar. And I'm yeah, I, I remember I used to be quite self-destructive though in those days because I thought I'd already figured it out. I thought talent was enough. And I think the first morning, or it could have been in the first week of my shows, I actually had a like bumper bashing on my way into work. And so I was late for one of my first shows, which was, you know, it's the kind of thing that you, you yes. it's, it's almost the universe giving you a message. But I, I was, I was kind of out of control in those days. I did a lot of stuff for shock value. There was also, there was a, there was a, a degree of, you know, I was talking to people my parents' age. So it wasn't a natural, I wasn't talking to, to peers. I had to up my game substantially. Look, I think a part of it must have been just blissful ignorance that I didn't realize that there were hundreds of thousands of people listening to me and that I could have been in serious trouble if I said certain things. I'm exactly like you asked me about what kind of person I was at school. I'm half and half on the fence of not giving a damn what people think of me which I think has been a, a, a strength, but also really caring what people think about me. And I don't know which one outweighs which, because they swap positions. I mean, sometimes I just really couldn't give a shit if everybody in the world thought I was the worst person that had ever lived. And at other times, I'm, it really it bothers me when people don't like me because mm -hmm. I might not have deserved their ire. So I don't know, you, you, you vacillate between the two and I love it. I think that the internet, is the most tremendous tool and we mustn't overlook all its good things just like we mustn't look at all of history and imagine that all of it was bad yeah. or the tremendous strides that it has given us in a very short time I mean, the amount of of development and discovery and innovation that's taking place now and the accelerated rate at which that's taking place is unspeakable by comparison with any other period in, in human or any other animal's evolution. We're, we're adapting on the truck. We're dancing on a moving carpet right now. The, the things that will happen tomorrow are more unpredictable than the things that could have happened at any other day in human history before us. Expression. If you live in an environment where you can't say what you really think or do what you say, you can also not have integrity. Those two go together to me. They're, they're, they're a similar thing why so many people are content to abdicate that to someone else is beyond me. I think deep down inside, we all have a need to express ourselves and a need to hear what other people are expressing. And the, the important side note to free expression, which was articulated best by Christopher Hitchens, was that it's not so much about you being able to say what you want to say, but about you being able to hear even the things that you regard as unpleasant, untrue, offensive, contradictory, and difficult, so that you can either improve your own argument or learn new information, change your decision, change your point of view. Isn't that the purpose of learning? Isn't that what an intelligent person should do? Waking at dawn, packing the gears, 